John y nos viene a hablar sobre esta innovación que es la impresión en 3D. Un aplauso, por favor. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Josh St. John. I'm the director of user experience at uh, 3D Systems. Um, you guys have probably heard a lot about 3D printing over the last couple of years. It's been all over the place. Um, so I'm really excited to be here, so I want to thank all of you. It's exciting to get to talk in front of you know, uh, entrepreneurs and students. I always uh, appreciate that opportunity. So um, before I talk about where 3D printing is at today, uh, I want to, uh, well, first I want to give you guys a, a chance. This is um, uh, my information, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, I'd love to talk to any of you about what's going on in 3D printing and digital fabrication. So as the director of uh, user experience, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about where is digital fabrication going. So when we talk about 3D printing, to me, it's just, it's just one piece of a much larger um, group of technologies. So even 3D printing itself is a lot of different technologies, and we'll get to that as we uh, go on. But 3D printing as a part of digital fabrication, digital fabrication's been around for a long time, and it's been really complicated. CAD CAM, design for manufacturing, CNC machining, all of these things are part of this digital uh, fabrication platforms. And actually, very few products are made with one method. Almost everything uh, that we're wearing or that we use is a series of different processes. 3D printing, additive manufacturing, maybe one of those. So um, just to start with that, you know, as we go forward, I, I really believe that if you look at uh, media, the way um, media from the invention of the radio to YouTube and how uh, the means of production and distribution and all of this is uh, kind of democratized. And now, instead of uh, having to watch a show at a time some people decided you should watch it, you can turn it on whenever you want. And it's the idea of a pre-programming is kind of offensive almost to some of us. I think in the future, the idea of shoe size will be a little offensive as well. Like, why, why is the shoe size, uh, what my feet are different sizes. I, I want different size shoes. I, I shouldn't have to be forced to buy uh, one pair. Anyway, we'll get, we'll get into some of that. So um, the guy who started it all off for 3D systems and for this entire industry, his name is Chuck Hall. And Chuck is just a, an amazing man. He's 80 years old, he's our chief technology officer, and he comes to work every single day. And if we're here talking about being an entrepreneur, uh, I get a lot of questions about, oh, how do I solve this problem, or how do I, I want to change the world. What are the first steps? And if you talk to Chuck, I watched him speak just the other day, and Chuck, um, he set out to solve a, a really specific problem. And that problem was um, plastic parts, first article prototypes is what we would call them, uh, for automotive or aerospace industry. So you have a design, you know, we're going back 30 years already. You have a design and, and you want to see it and hold it in your hand. That process either required using a, a model maker, a very skilled artisan, or it required uh, a tool maker making a tool and then actually going in, in, almost into the manufacturing process. And that was very slow, expensive, cumbersome. So what Chuck set out to do was create that faster. And this idea was all about if you could control the rate that an epoxy cured layer by layer by layer, you could build up an object. And all 3D printing, all additive manufacturing comes down to this basic concept. If I take a geometry, a cup, and I slice it into 5,000 slices, I'm going to have a cross-section. And it, I can build one cross-section on top of the other, and I'll make a 3D object. So Chuck was trying to solve how to do this out of plastic parts. And he was using lasers and photopolymers. And if you ask Chuck, what he was trying to do at that time, he was trying to give engineers a tool set to help them deliver their job better, to help them compete, to help them innovate. And today, if you ask Chuck what he's doing, he's doing the exact same thing. And he's doing the exact same thing in the same materials. He's still working in photopolymers. He's still working with laser or projected light. And he's trying to figure out ways to do it faster 
and deliver better material properties to that same group of users. So if you're going out to solve a problem, understand who those people are, understand exactly what the problem is, and understand if it's a problem worth solving. Chuck, I don't think he necessarily thought about the uh, future consumer market and people with 3D printers at their house and the maker movement or um, the fact that we can now print food. Chuck was really focused on a group of people he knew, a problem he understood, and he spent a lifetime uh, trying to solve it. And through that effort, he's been recognized by the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Uh, he's a recipient, basically, of the uh, um, same National Inventors Hall of Fame, but in Europe, the European uh, Patent Office. And uh, he, he's honored with the Economist Innovation Award. So it seems like a, a pretty simple, specific problem. How do we make plastic parts? faster for engineers, and it's provided a lifetime of work. And uh, the thing that really impresses me about Chuck when I sit down and I tell him about my ideas is how engaged and passionate he still is in the process. So that's Chuck Hall. He created our company. So a little bit about our company. Like I said, we've been around for 30, uh, 30 years. Um, and those 30 years started off just serving industry. And as we go, it's really spread. And um, now we have software business unit. We have a healthcare business unit. We have a consumer business unit. We have an education business unit. We have all of these different things. And they all fundamentally come down to how uh, do we as people make things? How can we make things better? How can we make them uh, serve a need uh, that is understood by, by an individual or a group of individuals? So. As I go through my slide deck here, I, I just want to talk about, you know, 3D printing is the hot new thing, but it's been around for 30 years, and a really great idea. They take this long, and, um, you know, we talk about exponential growth and exponential um, industries. The beginning of that curve, it's, uh, it's just hard work, and when you start hitting the hockey puck like we have maybe with additive manufacturing, it gets exciting, but you always have to remember that that work it keeps on every single day. And we have these um, teams that are constantly engaged in innovating for 30 years. So uh, leadership through technology is kind of the same point. If you, look at the, if you look at the portfolio that we now offer, we have everything from our cube printer for $999. It prints in uh, basically plastic. We call it PJP printing. Uh, all the way to our metal printers, printing in titaniums and... Uh, uh, all kinds of alloys. So across the breadth, this technology, when we have an innovation, um, perhaps at the highest end for stereolithography machines, for um, serial production, sometimes those algorithms we create end up being uh, having a really great purpose down at the consumer market too. It's, it's pretty fun to be able to think of an idea and then because the platform exists, be able to apply it to all these different technologies. And I think that's the difference with a startup. A startup, you got to do something really, really well. And now that we're this big company, we have this platform. So a lot of the features that we create, we can uh, use them in uh, a lot of different applications. So we, we call that the digital thread. And the digital thread, to me, is um, you have an idea in your head, and then you have a final object. And how do you connect it all along the way? How do you take it? You go from a piece of paper, maybe, or from Photoshop, starting digital 2D, and then you go into a 3D CAD program, maybe SolidWorks or PTC, um, Creo, and you start designing, or even Google SketchUp. And then you're looking at it, and you're a designer, and you're like, how do I make it? So uh, you might use a PJP machine, uh, one of our cube printers, and print out some first parts and look at it. It's like a three-dimensional sketch pad now. I can actually feel it. I can look at fit and form and see how it feels. And then I can start to think about how am I going to go to manufacturing. I don't have a market yet, so I only want to do... Uh, maybe 20 pieces to start just to get some prototypes going so I can work with some cloud manufacturing and then through that process I can understand tooling how much is my tooling gonna cost how much is uh, my labor gonna cost etc all the way to that finished product that goes to market and that's the digital thread 
And in the same way digital media has democratized, you know, you used to need this big studio in order to produce uh, video content. Now you can do it on your laptop, right? I think the same thing's going to happen. Before you needed GE or before you needed this huge industrial uh, installation, and now these tools are democratizing and they're, they're happening on our laptops. And uh, you can actually, with a laptop and a 3D printer, take an idea and have a plastic part in the same day. And that's really, really incredible. And I think that's, when we talk exponentials, I think that's where we're really seeing things ramping up. So materials, this is the other thing. People, uh, when they get the cube, they, uh, they look at it and it prints in you know, ABS, PLA. We have a water-soluble material. We have some other materials. Um, but they're plastics. They're, they're plastics and they're single material. Um, so people often ask, like, wh when are other materials are coming? They're here. Like, we have seven different print engines, and we print in 120 different materials. And that's plastics, nylons, metals. We print in waxes. Waxes are really cool. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But when you print in a wax, you can make a pattern. And then that pattern can go into investment casting. And now investment casting, this is thousands of years old. There hasn't been a ton of innovation in investment casting in the last kind of uh, couple millennia. It's pretty much the same. You take a pattern, you pack it with a sand or a ceramic, you melt it out, and you have a negative pattern that you can pour a metal into. Uh, but with a 3D printer, you can take a digital idea and make that initial master pattern and then create the, create the mold. And that goes to production. So you can take one and you can make many. Um, composites, so we're doing uh, digital materials. This is really exciting stuff. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I'd really geek out on it. But being able to take a, uh, a single drop of material and uh, blend it with other uh, drops of material to create uh, specialty composites. Uh, this is real exciting stuff. And ceramics. Ceramics, um, they can be used in electronics, they can be used in uh, the arts, they can be used in a number of uh, different applications and we're really at the beginning of seeing what 3D printing or additive manufacturing can do for ceramics. And I'm going to talk about it more later, but you can also print in food, in edibles. And that's, uh, I mean, just basically a lot of fun. Oh, I skipped one. So th this is some of the new elastomeric. Um, this is some of the new elastomeric. My videos aren't playing. But if they were, you would see that these elastomeric materials have seven times stretch. So in the first video, you'd be able to take the, uh, 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 the rubber band and stretch it. And in the second video, we actually hang weight from it. And this is really, um, <laughs> really going to change things. There's that Peter Thiel question about what's one thing you believe that very few people agree with you on. Well, my answer to that is I believe in the future, toys will not have hinges because we'll actually print the muscular se uh, section of the, of the toys so that they move more naturally instead of taking these beautiful sculpts that these artists do and putting these really primitive hinges on them. I think we'll have much more sophisticated uh, elastic material on the inside of the toys that will allow the toys to bend. I hope some of my videos work, otherwise uh, it's going to be a lot of me talking. So. Um, this we just announced, and it's real exciting for the consumer market. A lot of times when people take the cube printers home, they print them, and they have to do all these supports. And they don't understand why you have to do supports. But if I'm trying to print a person with my hands out like this, and I'm doing it layer by layer by layer, by the time I get to the arms, and it starts printing here, it's just going to fall down. There's nothing to hold the arms up. So you'd have to create these support structures. And this is pretty technical, and it can uh, lead to a kind of a user experience that's less than desirable. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make this just easy. How can we make it so you can bring almost any geometry in and just print it, and then drop it in water and take the object out? So you can see we have this kind of uh, ball in a cage, and you print, and it's uh, got two print heads. And it's printing like a, a, a PLA or an ABS out of one printhead, and this water-soluble material out of the other printhead. And at the end, you just drop it in water, it's safe to go down the uh, drain, and all of the support material just melts away. It's uh, really exciting, and we, and we just released it a couple of weeks ago. 
So I think the video is playing. Yeah, we got a video playing. On the flip side of PJP printing, we have fab grade direct metal printing. And for a long time, we thought 3D printing was all about customization. It was all about being able to do one, 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 one. It was all about being able to do prototypes quickly. But what we've learned is um, mass complexity is almost as, if not more important than uh, mass customization in industry. Because if you take something like a, um, on the bottom, it would be the bottom right, that's a tire mold. A tire mold, um, you know, these are really expensive to machine. It's part of a, a radial mold. And uh, the way those geometries are created is with something called finite element analysis. Pretty geeky stuff. But it basically uh, it generates the way the tire should be shaped, the treads on the tire, based on the way water will flow off of them. So you end up with this really complex geometry. And it's difficult to machine, because if you start with a block of something, you have to cut in. And when you end up with like undercuts, you can't get a tool in there. You can't cut it. With additive manufacturing, complexity is free. So what we're finding is the big industrial companies, they don't want to make 11111. They want to make these really complex geometries again and again and again. So if you look at GE's Leap fuel engine, they've been able to engineer a fuel nozzle that over the life of the aircraft is going to deliver some you know, 15, 20% uh, efficiency gain in fuel usage. This is billions of dollars. So sure, they'll pay more and wait longer to make that part because that part can't be made any other way. So we go all the way from the desktop machine for a thousand bucks and trying to make it dead simple to the industrial machine in titaniums and these advanced alloys, making them as complex as possible, enabling engineers to use shapes that they couldn't have made otherwise. A there should be waggling run, chasing tennis balls in the park, couch cuddles, tail shaking greetings at the end of the day. And for dog lovers, it's difficult to watch old ligaments take a toll on their ability to get around. Dogs that have cruciate ligament conditions often require lengthy surgeries and excessive rehab. But thanks to the TTA Rapid, a new canine implant from Rita Liebinger Medical, made with 3D Systems digital design and 3D printing, veterinarians can get dogs back to full strength faster. TTA Rapid implants are printed using 3D systems, direct metal printing, which allows for a level of speed and complexity unmatched by traditional methods. These tiny, highly detailed parts provide better stability in a fast, straightforward procedure, and most dogs are back to full strength in only six weeks with fewer complications. From Jack Russells to Great Danes, more than 10,000 dogs have the TTA Rapid implant, and the reviews are overwhelming. It's providing more walks around the block, more frisbees caught, and more toys chased. And for dog lovers, it doesn't get any better than that. I, I, I definitely could have showed a video about human patient-specific implants, but audiences just, just react much better to dogs. <laughs> so this is pretty cool, though. 10,000 different implants, right? And this isn't a unique implant on each dog. There's probably different sizes. But this is uh, just a highly complex shape that can't be made through a traditional means. So when people ask me why am I excited about 3D printing, it's this stuff. It's, we've created technology that allows things that were never before possible to be created. And it changes lives, whether they be canines or people. So this goes back to that idea of complexity is free. Uh, and it's something like, it's something, co complexity, there's no penalty for a complex shape. When you're doing traditional manufacturing, every, you take a block of something and every operation you do to it is adding some expense. If I take a drill hole or a cut or a grind, every single thing I do makes that part more expensive. Whereas it, a designer is sitting down trying to create and solve a problem and make it look good and fit a need. They're not thinking about 
how's it going to be made right at the beginning? That's really for the manufacturing engineer to kind of take the designer's idea. With, with additive manufacturing, there's much less of a gap. You do have to think about things like part tolerance and wall thicknesses, et cetera, but these really complex shapes can be made. So you have the turning, you know, a single ring that can turn, internal structures. This stuff is really cool. And actually, there's no good design tools in the world today that cater to this. This is um, something that we're really just beginning to wrap our heads around. Being able to design for this capacity, because the design tools of the past, CAD of the past, was designed for traditional manufacturing. Now there's a new set of tools. We need a new set of design tools. So this goes into the automotive. Actually, um, that picture that I showed you originally wasn't a piece of a tire mold. It was a, a medical part. That's a tire mold. So you can see it's this radial mold. And tires, because they're rubber, when you inject the uh, uh, part, they flex. So you can pull it out. You get a little bit of give. So you get these radial tire molds. So our 3D printers for metal, they have a certain size constraint. Tire molds are these radial molds, so it's like six pieces. And it just really fits. So if you look at 3D printing right now and where we really scale into industry, you need to have a market need. You need to have a material that's going to hit that need. And you need to have the, it, the size and shape be right. So uh, tire molds is one we discovered in the last few years. And it's, we're just changing the way all tire molds are made. All tire molds will be made in this way going forward because being able to use finite element analysis to drive those geometries uh, will keep your car on the road, will keep you safer. And uh, the only way you can do it is through additive manufacturing. Aerospace is another big one. This is that GE Leap engine I was speaking about. Now there's maybe uh, just a few parts in there that are 3D printed, but those few parts deliver an efficiency gain that's unprecedented. You know, we have a lot of fun, too, with, uh, you know, these, this new DIY drone movement. I, I have a 3D printer at my house. I have a soldering iron. <laughs> I can make drones in my house and put a camera on them and project it onto the screen. And, I mean, there's a lot of un uh, unimagined possibility there, but for... Uh, a hacker like me, it's just a dream come true. I have this workshop uh, in, in my little apartment. And, you know, here's a bird bone. And so when I was talking about um, we don't have good design tools yet, you know, if you look at a bird bone, it's something that's very strong and very light. Uh, and now, how do you design those structures? There's some fun things you can do with, uh, you know, scripting, but being able to keep exact dimensional control and being able to understand how uh, the strength uh, to weight ratio is actually going to uh, going to work, it, it, these are all very complex things. So we're beginning to see parts like this. This is a traditional: you take a block of steel, you cut it, you drill it. That's what you do. But now it looks like that on the inside, okay? And it has the same strength, but 70% less weight. So 70% less weight, this could mean less material. Oh, material savings. OK, but it's going to cost more to manufacture. Now, we're going to put this on an aircraft, or we're going to put this on a vehicle. How much fuel is this weight going to save? And when you look at that whole process, you're like, ah, Eureka, this is uh, unprecedented savings. And here. So this is an uh, exciting part. You can see the one in the background. You uh, put it into this kind of system, and it does finite element analysis, kind of a physics-based optimization, and it comes up with this shape. So I believe, you know, another one of those Peter Thiel questions, I believe in the future, designers won't build shapes. They'll build environments, and then they'll put uh, something like a design intent, if you guys know that term, design intent. What do I want this to do? So you'll actually say, I have this shelf and this wall, and I want to hold this much weight, and it will tell you how to attach the shelf to the wall. I don't want it to look like that, and you'll be able to adjust the way that it looks. So uh, this is kind of generative uh, modeling, and this is the brave new world of 3D design. I'm super excited with the lounge we just created. I mean, imagine if you only use 2.5 liters of material, 
and we've been able to create a 1.5 meter couch with several people can sit on it. So the lounge is made on a Pro-X 950 uh, 3D Systems stereo talking machine. Um, but what I've done with the lounger is just try to take optimized structures but still make it very aesthetic. It's not that we were trying to recreate the world's perfect lounger. No, I'm, I'm more, it's a more of an inspirational piece. You know, take a look at the silkworms. What did they do? You know, how is their cocoon made? How did the spiders, you know, make their nest? You know, how can those kinds of geometries and those kind of functions be used for other industries? My first question there was like, could I take massive spider web and metal plate it? With 3D technologies, I can express forms only found in nature. I used to spend days or weeks creating the perfect smooth meshes for 3D printing. With geometric freeform, I can smooth my models with just a click of a button. 3D technologies give me the ultimate freedom of creation. So imagine how much material would we be able to save from products, from you know building materials, from, from whatever, if we're able to manufacture things like this. Transportation costs will be marginal, energy consumption will be less. There's a whole range of benefits which we can't even fathom today. So, so that's Yana. Uh, he, Yana. Thanks. So, so Yana, he's been 3D printed. He, he was like an early, he was a CG guy, right? So this is one of the really interesting things I think that's happening. You have computer graphics industry like merging with engineering. So he was using all these CG programs and he heard about 3D printing. And this is before Shapeways, um, you know, this is before like cloud printing was really like a, a real thing. And, and he just wanted to use these, uh, you know, Max and Maya and CG programs to make shapes. And he started experimenting really early with 3D printing. Um, and now today, fast forward, all of the stuff that you know, the, those shape stru those, those designs, that mass complexity, that's starting to kind of make its way into like regular design culture. Um, I, I, I often think of, uh, you know, Art Nouveau is probably five, ten years before Art Nouveau, there was some advancements in glass casting, like using, uh, making glass and being able to cast it. Uh, and that, that really le led to the leak in some of the shapes that were being able to made, those kind of flowing patterns. And then if you look at Art Deco, uh, Art Deco was all about industry. So it was these stark hard lines. It was all Detroit and steel, the Empire State Building, you know, really strong, uh, extruded and kind of cut and uh, you know, all these, these shapes. And now you look at where we're going and it's like almost like a tech nouveau. It's these shapes that um, you know, are found in nature but then are mimicked by industry. So I, I think Yana was really, um, you know, he, he really makes me mad because he doesn't think about how to make things when he designs at all. So he'll hand me a shape and he'll be like, hey, make this. And it's like, yeah, you didn't think about any of this. He's like, no, I just want to make the shape. So I, I think that uh, when I, you know, I was discussing the brave new world of 3D design tools, those tools like our design tool, uh, Freeform, they, um, they're going to give designers the ability to control those really like, small nuances that make it possible to make something w during the design process. I'm an artist. That's why I do this. I love my work. I love my craft. I love closing my eyes and seeing where the forms and turns of every ring or cuff link takes me. But I have to make those designs real. That's the business part. And before the Projet 1200 3D printer, uh, making it real was... Uh, like making a compromise. This, this machine is $5, it felt like I had to dollars. shush my imagination and, and focus on manufacturing. Now I go into every piece knowing that if I can design it, I can make it. Period. Press a few buttons, walk away. And within an hour, I've got a 3D printed casting pattern that matches my design perfectly. I can go straight into casting. It sounds easy because it is, and at a price that I can manage. That's how my creativity becomes real. That's how I manufacture the future. 
I mean, th these machines costed a hundred thousand dollars just five years ago. Now you can get one for five grand and put it on your desktop. Jewelers can use them. I'm a, I'm actually a jeweler. That's was my background. I started 3D printing about 12 years ago in the jewelry industry. And those machines I was using were, uh, you know, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars, and they were really clunky. Uh, they didn't work all the time. And now you can get this, and it's just push of a button, print. It's that, it's that easy for these designers. And then, you know, it opens up different business models. Now you're shopping for an engagement ring. You know, men, this is something that really kind of, uh, they don't like walking into the store to buy the engagement ring. But now there's tech there. They can walk in. They can choose the part. There's new design tools being made to allow for customization at the counter. It's touching every every industry. And you know, I, I'm going to talk about digital literacy and digital education at the beginning, but for my own personal story, you know, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I, I do a lot of engineering now. I'm not a scientist. I was a jeweler. I learned to trade. I learned how to make stuff. And then the, one of the tools we were using became uh, applicable in a lot of different industries. So I, I don't know. I, th I think it really uh, kind of goes back to Chuck focusing on one thing. If you can find one thing that you're really passionate about, you know, you can't imagine where it's going to take you over the next decade, 20 years, 30 years. And uh, you know, cloud manufacturing, uh, maybe a lot of you have heard of these cloud uh, printing services. Um, they're all awesome. I, I just, I'm so excited that people can just upload stuff into the you know, interwebs and a real physical object comes back. You know, there's been so much innovation in IT, you know, in bits. You know, we have so many different, you know, opportunities for people on how to make an app and how to, uh, you know, improve an uh, IT business process. Moving around atoms, we've been much slower at. And the idea that you can upload a digital file and get something shipped back to you, this is real exciting to me. But like I said earlier, very few products are made with one uh, operation. So beyond cloud printing, that's good for prototyping or making, you know, a, a shape for the desk or cer certain products, maybe jewelry. Even jewelry, there's like setting and polishing and finishing, all these things. Cloud manufacturing, this is cool. Now you can go and you can talk to an expert, somebody who understands how to take your idea and make it real. And they'll help you take those steps. They'll help you bring it. You can have a turnkey engineering department, design department, at your disposal. And it's all available today. So ours is called Quick Parts. Um, we have uh, some of the most talented design engineers and mechanical engineers in the world that basically just do bridge manufacturing and design consultancy for people with ideas. So if you guys are thinking about hardware, if your startup's going to involve hardware, you don't have to build out the entire department. You can work with a cloud manufacturing consultant and you can get that uh, experience on demand. It's turnkey infrastructure. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brave new world in programming matter, in moving atoms around. We've talked about this already, but there's one point that I do want to talk about. Everybody, uh, if you look at the, the braces, you have these aligners, OK? This is another example of a need for customization in this point. Everybody's um, teeth are different. And uh, we, I don't know how many of you guys had braces. I had braces. It was awful. And uh, you know, I actually ended up ripping them all off in my garage uh, like during the last during the last couple of weeks, they were breaking. Um, so a line, basically some Stanford students came to our company, to my boss and CEO, Avi Reichenthal, said, hey, we have this idea. How can we use 3D printing to do custom aligners? We want to take an original shape and then have like 20 steps that the people just pop on it and it shapes them. And they were, these were just some guys with an idea, some people with an idea. Today, the last year, they produced 17 million unique patterns in a factory in the United States, local, a local factory, that produces 17 and a half million patterns. 
and it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I think last year they achieved like high 90s uptime. So this is just another one of these examples where there was a need, a material, and a process. The digital thread was able to connect it and deliver a, a, a new experience to the consumer. One of the biggest things that people don't recognize about why Align's been so successful, before Align, you had to go to an orthodontist to get a prescription for braces. There's less orthodontists than there are dentists. This technology empowers dentists to, to, um, to uh, prescribe and start the process. So their distribution model was also uh, much wider. When we saw the models, uh, our imaginations just flew off the charts. And what these soft, flexible models that are completely individualized allow us to do is to really do the surgery that we're about to do on the patient, removing the, the cancerous area and preserving the healthy tissue on a model rather than doing it for the first time on the patient. We were in the operating one, room one day doing a robotic um, kidney surgery and we were thinking to ourselves, boy, um, it'd be great if we could feel or see this, this two-dimensional image that we'd been looking at on a screen in our hands. And with our partners at, at 3D Systems, we were able to make a kidney and a kidney tumor that not only looked like a kidney, that not only was three-dimensional, that we could feel and touch in our hands, but it felt like a kidney. The goals of the project, like the project itself, are evolving. So far, we've been able to demonstrate that patients understand better what's going on with them when they see and feel the models. We've demonstrated that students have a better understanding of kidney cancer and kidney anatomy uh, with the models than they do with traditional CT scans. I think that the 3D models, in my experience, have really helped me, particularly, I think, in the really complex renal tumors. Um, those are the ones where you really want to uh, stay away from any surprises on the day of the surgery and, and I think anecdotally that's really been helpful for me. So this is my left kidney. So this is the tumor that uh, grew out of the uh, bottom part of the kidney. It was fascinating to me yeah. so I was very happy and it was learning as well for me. This project was very unique and very specific and it wouldn't have been possible without having a fantastic partner like 3D Systems that understood not only 3D printing but understood medical modeling. We've taken a, a new leap in 3D modeling and we've taken that leap into soft tissue modeling. So, thanks, it's pretty cool. He hits on a really interesting point. Previously, we'd only been working in hard tissues, and some of the advancements in the last couple of years is going to allow us to go into soft tissues. So like um, cranial maxillofacial facial work, so if you have a cancer resection, all that bone, that's been a digital, you know, that's been a digital process for a long time. Now there a whole new set of, um, a whole new set of opportunities are going to be opening up in soft tissue. I'm going to keep moving. This is, uh, maybe you guys saw Derby. Derby made his way around the Derby, internet. Uh, um, three months ago now, I think. Um, I uh, had adopted a dog through this rescue group called Peace and Paws. He so was she's actually born, one of our uh, product, uh, with product managers. She runs our, uh, and, uh, our I color printing at his photo line. And hearing a story, yeah. and I cried literally every time. Finally, so I, I, I want you guys to see Derby was, run before okay. I skip this. I only have five minutes Foster, left. But. I'll take care of him. So Derby I was born with this try, condition, to try and, help this dog. and we were able to design and print. We decided to get him a cart, yeah. which Not worked that. quite well, but they limit his mobility in terms of being able to play with other dogs, and it's not really the full motion of running. For Derby's project, we're using a variety of 3D technologies, and that allows us to get in there and really modify the organic uh, digital models quickly and easily and start to do the sort of designs that Derek wants us to do. 
The great thing about using 3D technology in Derby's case is having these images on file on a computer and being able to print them um, is a lot quicker than having to hand sculpt every single mold and rebuild these braces five, ten times. With prosthetics in general, a lot of the designs are going to this running man sort of look. Um, and I was concerned with doing a running man that, um, that he would end up digging them into the dirt. And so that's really where I came up with the loop idea. Hey, Derb. You got your new legs. Derby's new legs. We started them off very low and um, so that it wouldn't be too drastic. We have a line called the Project 5500, which enables us to run um, dual materials. That has really been key with um, designing his prosthetics. I got it. I don't become impressed very quickly, but when I saw him sprinting like that, it was amazing. It, it just, I couldn't believe it. The first time he was put on them and he took off running, he was just so happy. I was absolutely amazed at how well he did. He runs with Sherry and myself every day at least two to three miles. He runs faster than, than both of us. So, so that, that's Derby the dog. I wanted to get through that. <laughs> I was a little worried about not having enough to go the whole hour, but uh, I'm going to go. I'm an artist. I'm going to go over some of this. I do want to talk about food really quickly. This is real exciting. We have these food printers. Um, but this, we're working with sugars and chocolates right now, and it's, it, it's really cool, but it's kind of just the first step. What we're talking about is delivering customized nutrition. So, uh, you know, sugar was a good place to start. It's a lot of fun. We partnered with the Culinary Institute of America. We're 3D printing, you know, new structures, experimenting with programming taste. Like, if I can control bite-by-bite bite flavors and textures, it uh, creates a whole, whole new uh, set of experiences, especially at the high dining uh, uh, level. You can see just some pictures. And the 3D printing factory. So this is a new project we call Atlas. This is a high-speed printer. I'm not going to play the whole video, but this printer, uh, this printer, let's see if I can get back. This printer set up as a racetrack design. It's a different type of architecture than any printer we've made before. And it's allowing for uh, high-speed manufacturing. Um, it's nothing like it's ever been created. We've made one. There's no design tools that exist today to take full advantage of everything it can do. So, you know, part of being in user experience and designing those next gen technologies is looking at new platforms, new hardware platforms, and trying to imagine what's possible. So, I, I, I want to leave on this digital literacy because this is something that's really important to me. I wasn't a particularly good student, I have a lot of teachers that would attest to that. I, uh, I did learn how to do CNC programming when I was like 13, 14, and uh, just learned how to make things, how to use these tools, and this industry kind of sprung up around. And one of my things I'm most passionate about with our, with our consumer printers and our, our, our design tools for young people is teaching these tools early. This is just as important as teaching uh, uh, programming. This is just as in teaching as learning second languages. Learning digital literacy when it comes to digital fabrication. Learning what different geometry types can do is uh, really fundamental to uh, us as people changing the way we make things. So uh, I'm Josh St. John. I'm the director of user experience at 3D Systems. I'll leave you with this. Make beautiful things. Thanks. So, I, I do think we have time for some questions. Is that 10 minutes? Okay, cool. So, are there mics? Do we have them? Why no? No. Hello. Thank you. Oh, okay. That's the mic. I thought it was uh, like a gift. First, I was so impressed. My, I was, I'm, I'm not related. I wasn't related with this before. Now, now that I've seen it, like, 
in videos and photos, I'm amazed about the level that 3D print got. I, I wouldn't imagine. But is there a video or, you, or can you share some uh, media so we can see how the machines actually work? Like how are they printing the, the things you print? Yeah, uh, so I don't, I don't have a video that I can go to right now, but um, if you imagine taking that box that's in your hand and you were able to slice it into uh, 10,000 slices, so each one is only like a paper th thick. 3D printing is an umbrella term. And there's, uh, we have seven different print technologies. So it's all about laying down layer by layer on top of it. So uh, in the case of um, powder, uh, like our CJP printers, it'll lay down a layer of powder. And then a, an ink head, just like on your 2D printer, goes across it and uh, jets a uh, glue and a binder and then fuses it. And it goes layer by layer by layer by layer. And you end up with a box full of powder. And then at the end, you're kind of like an uh, archaeologist. And you reach into this box of powder, and you shake out this object. And then you take like an air gun, and you spray it all away, and you're left with this object. Um, on metal printing, for instance, same thing, powder-based, but it's using a laser. And the laser is melting the powder. And uh, it's fusing together layer by layer by layer, which allows you to really control um, something called hatching which is the way you come across the surface. So you're able to create um, metal properties that are totally unique, totally different than extruding or um, uh, casting. Um, and I guess uh, the, another one is you take a, basically a, a, a vat of goo, so liquid, and you shine a light into it. And each layer uh, solidifies into a plastic. And then layer by layer by layer, this thing uh, uh, kind of raises out of a out of a vat of goo. We have a joke, we say, uh, in dust we trust, in goo we do, because a lot of our technologies are just uh, dust and goo. And, and with food, it works more or less the same? I mean, it works the same? Exactly. With, which one? With food? Yeah, so there's a couple of different food technologies. Sugar is a powder, so we can use the powder-based systems for sugar, and then you can also extrude, so you can take uh, uh, chocolate and extrude it through a nozzle and you just have to control the, the temperature flow so that as you're building up the geometries it just doesn't kind of like gob away. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. All right, who else got a question? Let's go, uh, sorry, sorry, I'll come back to you. Uh, my question is, uh, what about the resolution of the, uh, print, of the printers? Uh, and what about uh, if we have to do some aerospace uh, project or automotive project? Uh, uh, you know that in, in that kind of works, they, they uh, need some specific uh, sure. resolution. And so his question uh, so was that the whole yeah. So his question is about resolution, and uh, resolution is also a product of the kind of layer size. So we're talking tenths, uh, t you know, 10 microns, 6 microns, but it depends on the material. So each technology and each material has different uh, uh, resolutions it can achieve. But for aerospace and industry, uh, we can get into the order of 10, 10 micron layer size. Thank you. Thanks. All right, here we go. I don't want to hit someone in the head with this. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi, Joshua. Isaac. Uh, I'm really excited about the technology. I think it's awesome. But I'm concerned about two things. And one is the possibility of like increasing unemployment because of the the um, how you call it traditional manufacturing. Like, and also, what kind of technology are they using to make these things more sustainable? Like, more friendly with the environment? To don't have that much plastic waste. Okay, so the first question I didn't really get. You're concerned about traditional like, manufacturing? Yeah, like the, the increase of unemployment in traditional manufacturing. Oh, sure, okay. So, I mean, that's a big question. I, 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 um, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, you know, smart pet factories open up a different type of uh, employment opportunity. So the digital literacy is a big uh, 
a uh, big part of that. And I think as we've dealt with, um, you know, a lot of manufacturing going uh, to Southeast Asia, et cetera, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, there's a lot of talent over there now, a lot of manufacturing expertise that's come up. Uh, but just the external, uh, the externalities of shipping and all of that stuff, when you talk about the environment, I think of that. It's better for products to be made closer to the place where they're going to be used. So I think there will be uh, employment opportunities, um, but it really comes down to that digital literacy, digital, uh, um, you know, those skill sets. We have, you can go on 3dsystems.com. We're hiring maybe 100 people right now. We can't fill those jobs. So our company, we, we have a lot of opportunity for people, and it goes all the way from blue collar kind of assembly work to, um, you, you know, co computational programming for digital representations of uh, yeah, mat materials. Um, the second question was about environmental friendliness. And I, so first of all, if you got to look at a product's entire supply chain to decide how environmentally friendly it is. So just by decreasing the, um, the, all of the steps going to market, that this is a, a tremendous savings, all the waste. The nice thing about 3D printing is the material's reusable. So after you print a part, like when you like machine a part, all of those other parts that come off of it, all of the waste, that has to go back to be refining. It has to be turned back into raw material. 3D printing, we're able to just clean it and then put it back in the printer. Not on all technologies, but pretty much true that there's like at least a 70% or 80% reusability from build to build. So I think additive manufacturing and 3D printing offer way more opportunities in terms of uh, employment and environmental uh, impact. I don't know how much more time I have. I think I, all right, well, here you go. Hey, thank you. What's the average speed of printing, let's say, the, the sofa that you show us in the video? What's the average speed? <laughs> uh, so the sofa took a while. That sofa wasn't, like uh, Yana, like I said, he likes to push the boundaries of things. I think it took over a day to print the sofa. Um, and the speed really depends on uh, what you're printing. So in certain cases, we can uh, print thousands of parts in an hour. Uh, some things you can print a single part in uh, two days. It really just depends on the technology, on the, uh, on the object. That's it. Thank you. No problem. Got it. All right. Back over here. I, just to see if I can reach you. Yes. Hello? OK. Um, I'd like to know, concerning the quality control, what's the error percentage? Or the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the standard deviation. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, you're asking a question that's on the top of my mind. So um, you know, being able to monitor as you print is really cool. Uh, we're just, so when you talk about the Internet of Things or the industrial Internet of Things, we're just beginning now to, uh, you know, start putting those sensors on the machine. So I, I can't give you like a blanket statement. It definitely varies from technology to technology. But where we're going with the platform we're building is being able to have a part and have uh, information about the exact conditions that that part was built in, material, the the beam strength of the laser, any deviation. At first, we'll just be able to um, deliver a report exactly of what it was made. But in the future, it's going to open up opportunities to be able to do corrective adjustments layer to layer. So if something went wrong, you could actually adjust for it. So um, I, 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 it's a very hot area. Okay. But so far, there is, when you print a part and then you print it again, there is a percentage of error. Uh, so it'll, there's definitely across different technologies. So I can't compare metal printing to stereolithography to food printing. Um, but there will, depending on the way that that machine was calibrated beforehand, there will be a differential. OK. But it's controllable. Yeah. Let's see if you, whoa. Oh, got it. All right. Um, well, hi, Joshua. I have a, the, my question is the following. Have you envisioned the creation of new industries 
with the printing, for example, the creation of new printing food with different tastes or of alloys for materials, or even companies specialized in printing bones or organs with bioprinting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, like I said, I, if, if you think about all of the innovation and I'm not the first person to say this, all the innovation in uh, IT over the last, like people say we live in this tremendously uh, uh, exponential time of innovation. Uh, I mean, I tell you, I just flew from Korea to New York. My flight was canceled in LaGuardia. Then I had to go to California and then fly here. I got here at 6 a.m. It was like 40 hours. I saw very little innovation in that process. That we are not good at moving matter around. We are not good at innovating with matter. So I really believe that uh, there's so much opportunity to do exactly what you're talking about. The problem is, it's really hard. And, you know, on the internet, there's all this infrastructure created to enable you to quickly be able to take advantage of API sets and all this um, other stuff that you don't have to do. That doesn't exist for manufacturing, really. So now that's what, we're laying, that's what we're laying out. So I hope that the next 50 years are as exciting for manufacturing and industry as they have been for IT over the last 50 years. I think I, that's it. All right, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to hang out, too, if you want to talk. And uh, you can definitely reach out to me. It was a pleasure.